those, we have over 1,800 1, executors. So uh, slaves m might run 10 to 50 uh, executors. We have on those over 30 instances, we have uh, over four, four and a half thousand jobs that are run then. Some more frequent, some are, are rather uh, dormant. But then kind of to take another uh, angle at how much we are doing stuff, we spin up for that 600 people, we spin up between 15,000 uh, to 18,000 virtual machine instances every day. And these are uh, kind of test targets or, or uh, build instances so that we create an instance, we uh, compile stuff and then we uh, trash that instance. With those numbers, we are facing more and more challenges with uh, Jenkins. While we kind of love it, while we utilize it so much, we are seeing some issues with the uh, stability under the number of concurrent uh, jobs and builds that we execute. Uh, another part of this is that uh, with 600 developers, everyone has their favorite plugins that they want to put running on the instance and, and, and some of these plugins are not on the same level of quality as, as the rest of the Jenkins. And this co causes, unfortunately, uh, stability issues with the Jenkins. We get downtime, so we need to take them into maintenance, reboot them, and this equals then for, for us, kind of basing stuff on continuous integration trains, um, kind of waiting and, and uh, loss of effort. When our continuous integration is not up and running, no work can go into masters and trunks uh, because it cannot be verified work. Another aspect is about this is that uh, with, with Jenkins, everything is tracked by, by the master. So uh, when we have to do maintenance uh, on, the, on the continuous integration instances, we might lose state and progress for jobs that lo uh, run for a longer time. We have, for example, some 12 hour uh, performance testing jobs, and then it's always when do you need to go into maintenance? Do I uh, want to do it now? Do I want to lose the progress of that? And, and so forth. So these are the, these are the kind of, uh, or this is the context where I started to look at, look at continuous integration, and this is how kind of this GI became to be. Um, the goals that I set up for, for this CI when I started was that, uh, first of all, it needs to be always available. So no matter what happens in the, in the system, wh whether we lose nodes, whether we take nodes for maintenance, uh, the system should be always available and always being able to accept new work and, and create new progress. So this is important. So that uh, our continuous integration efforts ne would never stop. Uh, second imp important, uh, goal is fault tolerance and kind of I isolation of failures. So no matter what happens with the system, uh, the impact should be minimized to as small as possible. So in this terms, if we look at, for example, slave dies, we should only lose uh, the effort that is done on that slave. If one uh, master dies, those slaves should still have the state and they should be able to kind of contribute back to the uh, build. Uh, the next goal is fault recovery. Uh, and this is when something happens, um, meaning that we lose, a, we lose a slave that is executing a job. I would really, really love being able to automatically recover from it by restarting the entire task. So then uh, from a developer's perspective, I could always kind of rely on the guarantees that when I start a build, it will eventually run uh, to the end as successful or, or uh, uh, with a, well, the whole build should, should just run and return the results. Uh, last but not least for me, I set the goal that it should be really scalable. Uh, I said we have about 30 instances of Jenkins. It's a lot of stuff to ma maintain. I would r love to bring this down to just a handful of items. So for that, that means that we need to support uh, thousands of configured jobs and, and perhaps hundreds or, or even thousands of concurrent builds running on the system. Um, there's two key concepts with this GI that make, uh, make it work towards those, those uh, goals. 
first one, uh, first one is the reversal of control flow, flow compared to, say, Jenkins. I wanted to eliminate all active masters from the system. And just, just so that we don't have a master that we could lose. That's so rather, rather than that model in, in this CI, uh, all the uh, progress and state transitions are made by, by either calling clients or then workers when they perform uh, tasks. Uh, all uh, work is done in a pull fashion rather than push fashion. Uh, and kind of, uh, well, there is no uh, active process that would track the state, but rather the, the responsible for, uh, responsibility for updating the state uh, is left on, on the workers, on the, on the slaves that uh, perform the actual uh, tasks. And in this CI, uh, since there is no uh, master scheduler, I uh, distribute the work by posting tickets. And tickets is an it item of work that remain posted until it's successfully completed by, by uh, uh, one of the workers. Perhaps on this one, my master is kind of if you want, would like to put it into that terms, my master provides views and hooks then to manipulate the global state on, of, the, of the repository. Um, another key concept I, I looked in, in, into what, what are the issues with our uh, uh, continuous integration at F-Secure was that the kind of the plugin model, why really, really important, it is really difficult to get right. So I looked at uh, builds and I kind of figured out that it had been chunked into a set of specific tasks. And then I realized that that's, that's the model that I want to run with this CI. So uh, rather than having pluggable ar architecture in, in terms of uh, libraries and, and implementations, I define workers that uh, do just one task, uh, do it well, and then uh, to gain that rich functionality of, of uh, different types of tasks, I can then chain these together. Um, and the benefit of, of this one is that uh, the, the workers become really independent. If there are any uh, faults in the, in the uh, implementations of, of the workers as well, it's kind of the, the impact is limited to that worker alone. It's, it's fairly easy to introduce new uh, functionality by just introducing new workers and then adding it to the chain of, of, of each build. And one good benefit of this model of, of or going back to the no active uh, scheduling is that we don't need to pre-register these workers. So we can bring them up and, and down based on real load on the system, based on say, for example, length of the queues or, or CPU uh, burn. Uh, just uh, to put an example of what this worker concept means, the very uh, typical uh, build sequence is that I want to check something out, out from a Git repository. That's one worker. I want to uh, run a make script or, or build script that actually builds a software. That's another worker in this context. And then there's the last worker for uh, digging out artifacts that we want to really publish and, and store for, for later use. Uh, then moving on to the implementation. Uh, my implementation of this CI actually was made really, really easy by, by two open source components. I use uh, Ceph uh, or, or storage system for maintaining kind of the persistent data. Um, uh, uh, that's, that's build artifacts, that's job configuration, uh, that's build state between the different workers. And, and Ceph comes out of the box with uh, this support for availability, fault tolerance. Uh, so it's distributed in, in that sense. So I don't have to reinvent that in this CI. I just need to make sure that uh, through my front end, the data is stored successfully on, on, on Ceph. Another technology that I use with this CI is Zookeeper. And this is uh, distributed uh, distributed coordination uh, service from a past project. And again, already built in uh, availability, built in uh, distribution. Uh, 
and I use Zookeeper for providing uh, distributed locks uh, amongst the system of individual nodes uh, when, whenever there's a uh, possibility for resource contention. So this could be uh, changes to job configuration, uh, assignment of, of build numbers, uh, trigger build and get a build number, so things like that where, where I need to uh, synchronize uh, globally within the system. That's about Zookeeper. If you're not familiar with Ceph and Zookeeper, I really uh, recommend uh, checking them out. They are absolutely fantastic uh, projects. Um, then lastly, to bring all this uh, together, I have a, a, a Python-based, just a relatively simple uh, front end that provides uh, REST, JSON, API hooks. Uh, for accessing the repository over Ceph and uh, Ceph cluster and, and Zookeeper data, and uh, then also to manipulate and synchronize where where it's possible or where it's needed. These front ends do not uh, hold any state, and they don't have any active processing. So whatever uh, manipulation is done to the repository and the uh, global state uh, happens during uh, one web request call. This makes it kind of then easy to make uh, or distribute and make highly available and, and uh, uh, fault of one node does not have any impact on, on the others. Uh, then there's um, uh, workers. And I men mentioned workers are extremely simple. They do only one test uh, task at a time. Uh, they are just smart enough to uh, call the front end, see if there's tasks that of, of certain type, start executing it, retry if there is a, a failure with the front end. So if front end goes down or if, if one connection to any of the storages, then we just don't progress to the next state. We, we keep retrying on, until that's successful. Uh, I wanted to me mention here this uh, simplified workers is um, this is something that I'm looking into, into very much in the future. Uh, we could uh, spawn these workers to have lifetime of one request. So for build tasks especially, this would be really good to kind of launch it once in a fresh VM instance or a Linux container to allow uh, whoever's uh, building anything to kind of set up full control over dependencies and yet maintain that there's no side effects to uh, next uh, build. Okay. Um, here's uh, then a uh, simplified picture uh, or picture how to all, all put all is put together. So we have the front ends that access a gateway basically uh, to the Ceph storage and, and the zookeeper uh, for synchronization. And clients and workers that utilize exactly the same API for accessing uh, uh, the state of the repository. And lastly, uh, I will talk a little bit about the results. Uh, I have a test set up, or I, I've used a test set, but set up in Amazon Web Services to kind of prove my, my uh, goals. And this was kind of uh, the setup spread over three availability zones. So in each availability zone, I have parts of the system. And with this one, I can then uh, go on and check check the uh, how this CI works against the goals that I've set. Uh, I'm pretty happy uh, where it is as of today. Availability, so I can uh, shut down uh, one uh, full availability zone, and still uh, the work is progressing. I can submit new new tasks, and they get uh, processed just as if nothing happened. Uh, Full tolerance is at the same level as well. So when I shut down one uh, availability zone, only the progress on those nodes that are uh, on the availability zone in question is lost. Everything else works as, as if nothing happened. Fault recovery is, is only on, uh, say, roadmap. I didn't start it yet, but the model of, of kind of tracking the state of the workers in, in Zookeeper, uh, I'm quite uh, hopeful 
that I could do full restarts uh, with ease. So if I detect a stale uh, node or a stale task, uh, I could just shut it down, reassign it to another worker and, and uh, complete uh, the build job even after failure. Uh, on scalability front, I, this is uh, very simple, uh, very simple uh, testing. Uh, so still need to try this out with real work, real co compilation work. But I can uh, already see that with this CI, I can host over 10,000 projects without uh, degradation on the performance. And I can witness 500 concurrent uh, built execution at the same time. So I'm quite happy on, on the scalability metric as well. One last uh, slide on the future. Um, the concept lo looks quite sound, so I'm quite happy where I am uh, at the moment. It's still very early for, for the project. Uh, I have to say I couldn't recommend it for general use as of yet. Uh, it works, but it requires quite a bit of effort to maintain it and, and uh, keep it operational. So the next uh, focus certainly for me will be on the documentation side and, and really make the tools so that it can be uh, taken into uh, more common use. Um, in the next uh, three months or so, I, I'm hopeful that I could launch a public uh, service of this CI, kind of similar to Travis CI, but on, on this CI. So offer that as a service for for those projects that host their stuff on, on say, public uh, GitHub. So more, more to come on that front. And while that is uh, said that it's still very early, I'm looking also for brave early uh, adapters and contributors. So if you're interested, check, in, check it out. Come to talk to me uh, and I can, I can show, you, show more. Um, that's my slides. Um, Maybe we could take questions questions now if, if there is, and then I I have a couple of uh, demo commands here uh, uh, prepared so I can show how it looks in practice. But let's if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. Uh, so you oh. mentioned the uh, you mentioned the uh, that you have very small workers, like a worker just to check something out and then a worker to, to build yes. something. So uh, can you? Talk about how the state transitions between that. For instance, a git checkout obviously is going to write files to a file system, and the yep. build needs to use those. Uh, so, uh, is it is it using Ceph to, to sort of transfer the data between these jobs? Or how, how does that work? No. That's a very good question. Uh, the workers have their own um, workspace that is on, on local disk, but between workers, yes, I'm transferring the whole, whole workspace back and forth to Ceph uh, from the workers. That is, that is, it, it's quite heavy on the network at the moment. Uh, I'm looking at if, if I could somehow make it uh, optimized so that if you have a worker that is running on the same host, we could just copy it over. But yes, that's, I'm, at the moment I'm pushing it back and forth. So what do you use as a, like a kind of a presentation front end to look at the results and notify developers about regressions? Like do you still use the, uh, like do you use Jenkins for that or do you have a custom system for that or is that somehow built into Zookeeper? No. Uh, the, the front end provides a HTTP REST API where you can get the state of, state of the builds. This is a little bit early into the project. I was actually hoping to be quite a bit far, uh, further uh, by the time of this presentation. Uh, within F-Secure, uh, we are having just one or two projects that are, are using this CI so far for building. And they are quite far with the automa automation, so they use the REST APIs directly. Yeah. But uh, UI is certainly something on, on my list at some point, uh, utilizing the same APIs and provide the, providing the views in a little bit more user-friendly manner. Could you say something more about um, so configuration changes? Say I'm making a change to a build command or to what the workflow is, uh, and uh, do I need to 
do any restart or do I just like post a new path? Okay, um, let me check. I could show what, what I want. I could show um, all the job configuration is, is uh, again, JSON. Um, let me see. I have a command line client here. Uh, yeah, let me see. Let's see what we can see from here. This is basically a, a job configuration for this GI itself. Uh, how I build, the build and package this GI. Uh, we have a set of tasks that get assigned to workers. Uh, git checkout, execute shell, which is kind of running the uh, make, make script and, and so forth. And then finally I have uh, one uh, task for actually build the, uh, or making the build artifacts. And this is when I have uh, these configurations and then just my command all for setting up a new configuration would be, oh, no, sorry. Like this. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the, 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 but it's a good question. Um, job configuration gets embedded in the build while the build is triggered. So uh, the order of where, you, when and how you change job, job configuration is. Um, sorry, did, did that answer your question? So how do, how do we manage? Yes, yes, yes. So at the time of the trigger, triggering a job, we uh, take the job configuration. Yes, basically. It has a bit of a hierarchy of... Uh, I'm you, oh, sorry. Job. He has a bit of a hierarchy within uh, Zeph on how do you store jobs and, and then builds underneath the jobs and so forth. But yes, it's stored in, in Zeph. And I had a completely unrelated question, which is one of the challenges that we have found with Jenkins is that we, we use permissions not to protect against um, malicious people, but we use a lot of permissions um, to protect against accidents because we have so many different communities and so many different folks who support that feel that Jenkins has, is missing, they'd really like to have much better integrations with external permissions. Certainly, because if you use file system permissions, what's then to say LDAP or Swift, you could use file system permissions to provide that natively, but I don't know if your job structure is such that you could assign um, at the file system level jobs to groups and then use that to drive permissions natively. Is that, if you have a sense of how yeah. do you Uh, quite possibly. Um, I'm, although I have to say I'm kind of tempted to move uh, even further away. Now I'm using ZFS cluster file system. I would rather use just a raw object storage where I don't then have the permissions. Um, it's a tough question. For, for us in those numbers, we are really telling our developers that Jenkins, for example, is just not the storage place for artifacts. That they, whatever is on the Jenkins instances is bound to be temporary. Um, one aspect of, of uh, also that, that we instruct our Jenkins users that don't store any job configuration in the Jenkins itself. Just make easy hooks, call make, and have then the logic in the repository itself. So in that sense, I've, I haven't face too many issues with the kind of uh, user perfect per or access uh, rights management in our use. Oh. But certainly that would, perhaps we can talk after this session and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, see if I could embed <laughs> your requir requirements into this CI.
software projects like Android where the source code is in the gigabytes or so, and then how does that work on like when you call main on an IO bound uh, you know software project like that where it can open up a whole bunch of files? Have you noticed any performance degradation or have you tested that before? Oh, I have not tested that big uh, of an IO load as, as, as Android. Uh, on the other hand, kind of the worker uh, configuration uh, it depends on your environment, where you run the execute script that does actually the building. If you can uh, provision enough resources on that platform, then that resource use is actually local. And only when it comes then back to transferring the workspace back and forth, then we're touching kind of the, the front end and, and the storage. So how much of the remaining uh, Jenkins funcio functionality are you actually still using? Because Jenkins is a particular piece which we're actually looking out for getting rid of because it's so utterly complex and just falls over if several people touch it. So it seems like you actually replaced most of that with uh, this JSON configuration, for example. One thing that I didn't see was polling for new commits, but I guess this is also rather easy to do with a super worker. Um, yes. So uh, what? Functionality. Um, this this GI is still fairly simple, but uh, the the workers, for example, here are pretty basics or pretty ba basic. But if we would want to kind of analyze, say, nose test results or or uh, plot the graphs on on some metrics, we could just create a worker that can dig out that information from the workspace and perhaps create artifacts of, of, of the images. So this GI itself uh, tries to be as minimal as its core as possible, but then offer that opportunity to extend the functionality through the easy, easy uh, creation of new worker types. Like, you could run all this without even using Sorry? You could run all this without even using Jenkins? Well, yes, yeah. Regarding the way that you've got this CI yeah, deployed in your use case right now, I got two quick questions. One is the um, job configurations that in the JSON that you're just looking at, do you store those in a version control separately to this or you just not? And then the other question is um, the uh, underlying distributed uh, object cache that you're talking about in the ZPFF, will that stuff work in a geographically distributed environment or do they all need to be, you know, uh, latency requirements and stuff dictate that you need to have it in the same data center? Or Okay, um, the first one, I do not version uh, the job configuration here. That's, that's kind of something that I would encourage any developer to do, that whenever you uh, publish new job configuration, measure, make sure that it comes from the same repository as the rest of your code. Uh, Zookeeper project does not itself uh, recommend running over uh, long or high latency links. I have not tried how that works. Uh, that's it. But the, 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 it is a kind of good point that it would be really nice capability to also be able to um, have that system over regions, over long distance. But at the moment, no. It seems like the, the architecture so far is uh, designed around internal use at F-Secure, uh, but you mentioned um, your desire to make it a public service. Um, I, I, have you, um, sorry, what are your thoughts about how to do that securely? You know, and presumably mm -hmm. these workers are going to be running untrusted code from random repositories on, on GitHub, and um, you know, uh, would, would they still have access to Ceph or any of the other shared things? Would they be able to, to, to you know, poison the, uh, um, where artifacts are published or poison the, the, the DISCI configuration or things like that? Mm. Uh, that's a good point. Um, uh, the workers don't actually access the Ceph cluster and Zookeeper directly. They all go through the through the front end components that it's used by by clients and workers alike. So there we could do uh, authorization on on who gets to access. Now, as far of uh, as far as running untrusted code, 
uh, I mentioned there in the slides that we w could have an opportunity to launch a spin up a new VM or, or Linux container for, for the execution task. So uh, in, in that essence, the, what I now have there, the make file, uh, that worker could be uh, modified to create a new container for that make command. And once that's finished, then, w then we can collect the artifacts. But that way we could limit on the container level the access to internet and the access to the services that is uh, that are required. We did come in late. Um, oh. Maybe you mentioned this already. What language is your CI written in? It's ri written in Python. Uh, which version control systems do you support? Uh, <coughs> for the jobs, it's uh, currently Git, but the kind of Git checkout is one of a worker type of its own. So it should be fairly easy to create workers for SBN or CVS, similarly. So there's one good point about this worker model is that now we can also split uh, uh, we split the Git checkout to happen on a different node and in different authorization context as uh, running the actual make script. So for example, now uh, if we set them up running on, on two different contexts, there's no way that the, the build steps actually might have access to Git credentials, for example. So that's just what added benefit of splitting the workers in, in isolated tasks. Time. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to thank you if, if anyone wants to leave. I'm going to show just a couple of qu uh, commands on how, how this system works in practice just to get a little bit of a hunch on, on this one. But if you have any more questions, just keep them coming. Mm. So I have a very um, simple command line client uh, and just to show the configured uh, jobs. Now, this is running on my local host. Uh, two jobs configured uh, there, uh, then I can, oh, sorry, Oops, that I showed already. So just a uh, uh, job configuration that is, is JSON, another one, there's list of tasks, uh, this particular does nothing but sleeps, but uh, two different tasks, if I launch it, get the state of the uh, build, sleep number three. Oh. Date. Sorry. Well, here we can hope, hopefully see. This is now stored in, um, oh no, this is the build state. This is still store, stored in the uh, Ceph configuration. Um, but here we can see the different, or here's configuration actually tasks, no task has been spawned yet for this one. See if I, that update. Now we see the tasks, there's the first task is pending, uh, looking for a worker that can uh, fulfill these promises. So type execute uh, shell worker, and then I have a node label, uh, just arbitrary name, uh, Debian 6, so I can have different workers that are capable of building with different environments or different uh, operating systems. Uh, let's see if, if there is it's still running. I'll show you then. So a couple of tasks. This I go, I'll show how these looks like or look like. now uh, in, in Zookeeper. Uh, there's one worker that I didn't mention, but build control worker, which kind of manages uh, spawning different tasks all together. But uh, this is how they look. And here, the assignee part is, 
uh, indicating the worker. So in the future, when I'm looking at restartable ta uh, tasks, I hope to see that when this one is stale, then I can restart the entire task to make sure that all the triggered builds will eventually finish. Okay, now there's three tasks. Let me see. I can capture them before they go. And here is another task. Now this is complete, so already uh, accomplished. Just collecting uh, artifacts from, from the sleep pattern happens to be date capabilities again indicate what kind of type of worker it is. And then if we finally go again. Oops. Now this is uh, complete. I'll show it from the beginning. Status is complete. We run through all the tasks. in order we ha should have somewhere we saw the success and we will have the list of list of the uh, build artifacts that are created that can be then referenced by by other scripts um yeah that's a good question that Unfortunately, and there I don't have a command to show it. But yes, the, each of the uh, workers can and actually will uh, submit a console log where they ca collect both standard output and standard error for storage. All right, thank you. Uh, if there's any more questions, just pull my sleeve at any time in the conference. <laughs>